Okay, are you ready for the Word of God today? Amen. Let's take a look at what the Lord uh, would say to us. I have a message on my heart that I, I really believe God has put there. And the message that I want to talk to you about today is courage to face the future. And I'd like to ask if we would pause right now and just ask the Lord to open up our hearts. Dear Lord, we see in your word that you opened up hearts of people so that they could respond to the message. And so, Lord, we believe that you're the one who has not only given us your word in the past, but you also anoint your word in the present so that we might be able to receive that fresh word from you. And so we're praying, Lord, for uh, any kind of scales to come off our eyes, any kind of distractions to be cast down, anything that would be bothering us, that would hinder us from hearing, we come against that in Jesus' name. We ask that you would help us, Lord, to uh, hear your word, to receive and apply your word. Thank you, dear God. Give us ears to hear and lips to speak. We pray in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Amen. What if you went to the doctor this week and the doctor looked you straight in the eye and said, you have one week to live? What would that do? How would you feel? You have one week to live. Seven days left on this planet. Now, I'm glad that God doesn't reveal to us very few have a premonition that's right and accurate, but I'm glad God doesn't say to us, well, you're going to die on such and such a day or such and such a year, and this is what you're going to die from. Aren't you glad he doesn't do that? You know, we would worry about that, wouldn't we? We would be just so consumed. But you know the Lord Jesus not only knew when he would die, but he knew exactly how he would die. And so here he is, one week away from his death. And this death of Jesus is like no other death. I mean, other people in history have been crucified on a cross. That's bad enough. But Jesus is not only going to be crucified, but Jesus is going to bear upon himself all of our sins. All of the ugly things we've ever done in our life is going to be on Jesus, on the cross. And for a while, he's going to feel that separation because he has become sin for us. The one who knew no sin. So this death is like no other death. What Jesus is going to need is courage. You know what we're going to need in life? Is courage. Let's take a look at the message today, which is about looking ahead, facing tomorrow with courage. This day represents the day that Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament and to announce to Jerusalem their Messiah had come. So let's take a look. Rather than reading this portion of Scripture, I'd like to just kind of show it to you on a little bit. From John chapter 12, verses 12 to 15. Is this Jesus of Nazareth? He's a prophet, a great prophet. A prophet? On a donkey? Listen to the healing of the sick! You have come to deliver us! Isaiah said, Jerusalem, go 
daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, humble and meek. I would uh, like to fast forward from that event to several days later where Jesus <coughs> is meeting with his disciples and he only has hours to go before he's put on the cross. So we're going to read John, uh, John chapter 16 <coughs> verses 31 through uh, 17 and verse 5. Okay. So... I think what we need to do um, is, yes, there we go. All right. So we're going to read this uh, together. You don't have to necessarily read this, but I will read this for you. So Jesus is with his disciples, and he says to them, You believe at last, Jesus answered, but a time is coming, and has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And then chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus said this, after he said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. <coughs> Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Can you say amen to the reading of God's Word? Amen. amen. So when it comes to the future, tomorrow, it's easy for us to think the worst. Sometimes we can dread the future. We can be filled with fear, anxiety. So, how is it that Jesus could face the future knowing when he would die, knowing how he would die, but yet face that with courage? How can he do that? Well, you say, well, because he's God. Well, that's true. But he also is fully man. And so, as fully man, he needs to receive strength and courage. Now, I want to just share with you something that's vitally important about courage. Courage is the fruit of something deeper. In order for us to experience courage, we have to have that which is beneath the surface, which is called confidence. Because courage springs from confidence. If there is misplaced confidence or no confidence, then there is false courage or no courage. So, my question to you today, and I've been asking myself this throughout the week, is what does Jesus teach us about courage? What does he have to say about the inner life of confidence from which courage grows? That's the question. 
What Jesus teaches us through his life, and through this last week especially of his life, is do not misplace your confidence. Now, when Jesus was on the donkey and was going into Jerusalem, many people were extremely happy that he was there. They were very emotional. And I'm sure that Jesus appreciated the hearts of the people in a sense that they were trying to reach out to him, trying to acknowledge him. But I want to tell you something. That Jesus never places his confidence in the emotions of other people. You know that, don't you? I mean, he could have said to his disciples, he could have said, wow, look at this. Isn't this great? This is like oh, what I've been waiting for. Now we have a name. He could have said that. But Jesus knows that for most people in Jerusalem, it is merely an emotional experience. He knows that. In fact, rather than being on some high emotional mountain because of this, Jesus actually cries over the city. I mean, the opposite emotion. While the people are cheering and all this, Jesus is weeping because he knows that Jerusalem is missing its opportunity. Most of them don't get it. They're just caught up in the emotion. So the confidence of Jesus is not in the emotions of people, not even his disciples. I mean, when Jesus was with them at the Last Supper, he makes this startling announcement saying, you know, one of you is going to betray me. And all of them, you know, get very riled up and say, you know, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me. And then Peter, you know, he's really emotional. He stands up and he says, even if everybody else denies you, I never will. And the others will say, yes, you know, we're with you. And so what happens? <laughs> So Jesus loves his disciples, but he's not putting his confidence in the emotions of his disciples. And Jesus doesn't put his confidence in the changing circumstances of life. You know, sometimes we're going to go through really good times. And we can think, whoa, I got it made. Life is easy. We get all, you know, happy. And then we go through really tough times. And what are we tempted to do? We get all depressed. Life stinks. God hates me. We just, we have these emotions that if we allow them to, they can control our life. Amen. But Jesus doesn't misplace his confidence. His confidence is in something more than the feelings of life. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. So what does Jesus teach us by his courage? He teaches us to have confidence in God. The Bible teaches us in the book of Malachi, God says, Behold, I am the Lord, I do not change. We can have confidence in a God whose character is always consistent. He's always faithful. He's always holy. He's always good, even when we can't see it. But this is what the Bible teaches us to put our confidence in. And so what does Jesus say? You know, when everything is looking great and everybody's cheering him and the palm branches are going down, Jesus is saying, but there's a time that's coming tells his disciples this. When you will be scattered, each to his own home. Now, this is pretty sad, when you think of it. You will leave me all alone. That's what Jesus is saying. Said, I love you guys, and I know you think you're for me, but you're going to leave me alone. Yet, I love this part, yet, I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Yes. So this is telling me that I don't have to 
to be alone in life. Even if I feel like nobody else in the world understands what I'm going through, it's okay. It's okay. Because if you're a believer in Jesus, then the Bible tells us that you are never alone. Isn't that, that, that I am comforted by that. Because I need to know that I serve a God who's not going to be emotionally involved with me and one day he's going to say, oh, I love you. And then on Wednesday he's going to say, you know what, you're disgusting. I don't want anything more to do with you. I'm glad I don't serve a God like that. He's not an emotional God that is up and down and in and out of our lives. The Bible tells us that He is for us, not against us. So have and place your confidence in God. Sometimes in our lives, there are little snapshots that we remember about our childhood. One of the vivid memories I have in childhood is learning how to swim. You guys, can you go back there, some of you? Some of you is a little further back than others. <laughs> but learning how to swim. And I remember that I lacked confidence. And so I would be up to my waist in water, and I would go ahead down into the water, and I would dog paddle and try to keep my head above the water. But I always felt good to have the sand underneath me so I could stand up. But one day, one day, I went to the end of the pier. There was this dock that was there. And I'm looking down into these dark waters, and it is over my head. But, I have someone with me. My mother. <laughs> And my two brothers were all learning how to swim. And my mother is there, and she knows that I can do it. And so she encourages me. She says, go ahead and jump. It's okay. I'm right here. So I'm looking at the water, looking at my mother. And I jump. And I dog paddled all my life, and my, my head pops up above. And my mother's right there, her arm just reaches in. That was the first time I knew that I could swim over my head. I remember that so like, like it was yesterday. Sometimes in life, what we want to do is we always want to live where we know we're just waist deep in water. Where we can always feel our feet on the ground. But I'll tell you something. To grow in God requires us many times to jump and to say, God, I believe that you're there because I want to obey you even though it's going to be difficult, even though it's a little scary. It's okay because the Father has not left me alone. And so we are to put our confidence and our courage in God. And I also received from this, from the life of Jesus, that he wants us to have confidence in himself. Okay? Confidence in Jesus, because Jesus isn't just another good guy. Yeah, I kind of cringe when I hear people talk about God, like, yeah, he's the guy upstairs. Hello, he's a whole lot more than the guy upstairs he made upstairs. Amen. And Jesus is not just a good person, he's not just a good prophet. The Bible tells us that Jesus has overcome the world. What is the world? Anything in the world that you and I will face, he's already overcome. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus is the authority. There's nothing in the world that's greater than Jesus. All authority, Matthew chapter 28 tells us this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. Because he who is in the highest place took the lowest place, gave his life, and now has been exalted to the highest place above all. This Jesus Christ is our Lord and God. And we can trust him. 
we can have confidence in Him. The Scriptures tell us that when Jesus came to earth and was born as, in the, as a baby in a manger, that wasn't His first appearance. Jesus was with God from the beginning. The Bible tells us, Jesus praying, He's saying, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So we can trust Jesus. We can put our confidence in Him. After all, what else does He need to do to prove that He loves us? He can't do anything more than what He's already done to show us. Have confidence in Jesus. Now, this next statement, I'm, I really struggled with this, this, this week. I said, Lord, do I say this? Do I not say this? Yeah. Okay, I say it. When it comes to courage, you have to have confidence in yourself. Now, if you're trusting in God, you're trusting in Jesus, then there's a natural ability that God gives you to be able to trust in yourself. You're trusting in God who is in you. You see, there's too much emphasis in this world on confidence, but it so easily slides into pride and arrogance. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. Jesus doesn't say to us, well, have confidence in yourself so that you can think of yourself as better than other people. No. He wants us to have confidence in ourselves that's based upon what He has said about us. For example, you can have confidence in who you are when you know whose you are. You see, answer the question, who do you belong to? And if your answer is, well, I belong to God, I'm His, then that boosts your confidence to a, a supernatural level. Because you can have confidence not just in your own puny strength and abilities, but you can have confidence in the one who said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's in Philippians. That's what God says about you. And Peter describes us as a kingdom of priests and kings unto God. So in God's sight, He has given us an ability to serve Him and a confidence that comes from that ability. So, Jesus put it this way. Jesus said, I told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world you're going to have trouble. Does the world ever uh, knock at your confidence? You ever have people at work that want to you know, see you out? You ever have people around you that just want to cut you down? People that just try to destroy you? The world is like that. This is the world in which we live. We're going to have trouble in this world. But Jesus tells us, take heart. This is the word courage. This word courage means to be bold. So Jesus is saying, you can be bold even in the midst of a world that tries to knock out your confidence. Mm -hmm. You can be bold. In fact, there's a proverb that says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are what? Bold as a lion. So you can be bold and have confidence in this life because of God. I used to think that humility was sort of like timidity. If you're really humble, you'll be very timid. That's not true. Humility in the Bible is strength under control. It's the strength that God has given you, but it's controlled to serve and to bless others. You see, you don't have to go after humility and have timidity. You can have humility and yet be bold. Because when you're doing the right thing, you don't have to fear anything. 
I remember a guy in college, a real good friend of mine. He thought that humility was timidity. And so when we were together, he would always say to me, oh, I'm sorry. And even if I didn't, if I looked kind of different, so oh God, did I say something wrong? I'm really sorry. No, you didn't say anything wrong. He was always saying, I'm sorry. And so I told him, I said, man, you don't have to continue to say you're sorry. He said, then what did he do? Oh, yeah, well, I'm really sorry. <laughs> oh. He's still my friend today, but it just drove me crazy. Because he thought that being humble meant always thinking that you're uh, a worm on your shoe. <laughs> no. It's realizing that any gifts that you have, any strength that you have is from God and using it appropriately. So it's okay to have confidence in yourself. Look ahead with courage. Have confidence in your work and your calling. Confidence in your work and your calling. How many of you know that you have something to do in this world? Okay, you, you know you have a calling. God hasn't given you life just to eat your way through life. Okay? I like to eat. I like to eat. But that's not, that's not our calling, it's just to you know, eat or to sleep our way through life. I like to sleep, I need sleep. But that's not the mission of God for your life, to just eat and sleep. Right? Okay. Not even watching movies. No, I can watch a good movie once in a while. That's, that's, there's something that God has called us to do. So if you're a parent, you've been called to disciple your children. Uh, if you have a job, you've been called to be a light and a witness at that job. And every single day of your life, you're called to love and serve other people. So whatever that calling is, God wants you to have confidence that you can do that. So don't tell yourself, well, I don't have any gifts. I don't have anything that God's called me to do. Therefore, I'm just going to sit in a corner and cry. No, God has given you something to use to bless others. He's called you. The Bible says, Jesus said this, He said, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. So Jesus had a work to do and He was able to complete it. You have a work to do and if God gives you a work to do, you are able to complete that work. It's not as if you say, oh, I can't do this. No, God will give you the grace to be able to complete what he's called you to do. Amen. And he wants you to have confidence that he will use your life, that he will bless your life, that he will bring glory to himself through you. So instead of just always looking at our own imperfections, we need to look at the strength of God. We need to look at the Lord and say, Lord, I believe that you've given me a work to do and that I can do this work through your strength. I don't know what the future is going to bring. This week might be the most uh, cataclysmic week that the world has ever known, that our nation has ever known. It might be. Or it might be a lot like last week. We don't know. I don't pretend to know who the next president will be. Neither will I make a lot of comments on that. <laughs> I don't know. Tomorrow may be a really good day for you, or it may be a really, really tough day for you. I don't know that. But God reveals in His Word things about our future. And so what I do know about my future 
gives me courage to face what I don't know. Okay, are you with me? I do know that Jesus loves me. I do know that. And I do know that Jesus has a plan for my life as well as he has for your life. And I do know that if everything else in this crazy world crumbles, that Jesus still is Lord. Amen. And he said, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And I do know that if tomorrow is my last day on this planet, that there's a home in heaven forever and ever and ever that I will be with Jesus. And it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So, will you receive the courage of Jesus? Will you receive that today? Or can you receive this message? Amen. Will you grow in your confidence? Not in you. Don't go around walking around and say, oh, you know, this is what the world does. Oh, I'm such a great person. You know, this is so wonderful. Like that. But, that's foolish talk. You want to say, man, I serve a great God. Even though I've done things wrong and I, I, I'm a sinner, I have a great God. He's, he's able to keep that which I've committed unto Him. He's, he's awesome. Amen. I'm going to walk in that place. How about you?